Are there any current plans on bringing more LGBT plus characters into the MCU, specifically the T trans characters? Yes, absolutely, yes. Awesome. And, and, uh, and very soon, in a movie that we're shooting right now. Yes. yes. <laughs> this clip, featuring a Q&A with Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige at the New York Film Academy, was filmed in December 2019. And though, for obvious reasons, the movie he's hinting at has yet to be released, it's not hard to ascertain exactly what the movie was. Marvel's Eternals, the 26th film in the now decade-plus spanning Marvel Cinematic Universe, was deep in production at the point of this interview. And though Feige has since stepped back on his claims about including any transgender superheroes, he remains insistent that the film will feature the universe's first openly gay character. Here's the thing though, I kind of don't believe him. Of course, it's a nice sentiment. Actors Brian Tyree Henry and Haas Sliman, who play the characters of Fastos and his husband respectively, have been quite outspoken about how beautiful of a moment their on-screen kiss will be. And honestly, I would love to see it. A happily married gay character, who is not defined by his sexuality, is exactly what we need in a movie of this scale. But how many times in the past has the LGBT plus audience been baited exactly like this? For context, I've been out as gay for five years, and having grown up in the deep south of the USA, I have to say that there's an alarming number of people who still remain closed-minded to any and all worldviews other than their own, be they race, religion, or specifically in this case, LGBT plus rights. So sure, I might be biased, and you can call me that, or something much worse if you like, but I believe representation in media matters because our relationship with media is twofold. Just as our media is shaped by the world around it, so too is our world shaped by the media we consume. Again, you can call this SJW pandering, or believe that any LGBT plus representation is part of some nefarious homosexual agenda, but I believe this is why representation matters. Because once we begin to see equal representation on our screens, it suddenly makes you look at the world with a whole different perspective, and through the eyes of someone else. All that being said, Hollywood today isn't near as progressive as they'd like to have you believe. Sure, in the case of something like Disney, we're finally getting movies like Black Panther and Captain Marvel, the first black and female-led Marvel superhero movies. But it also took them 18 films to even get to that point. And more on topic for this video, for the sheer number of supposedly new LGBT plus characters they're introducing, it's shocking how little representation is actually occurring. I previously hinted that I don't really buy into the idea of the homosexual agenda, but in the case of Disney, I actually don't think simply denying the existence of one agenda is enough. Because it's not that they simply don't care to include LGBT plus characters, they seem to instead insist upon dialing down said representation to its bare minimum. A heterosexual agenda, if you will. That said, if we're talking about LGBT plus representation, we need to go a bit further back than modern day Disney. In fact, I'd say we need to go just about all the way back to the beginnings of cinema itself. If you've never read up on the subject, you may be surprised to find out just how queer-friendly early cinema was. The Dixon Experiment sound film, recorded sometime between late 1884 and early 1885, was the very first motion picture to feature live recorded sound. And what should it feature but two men dancing to a violin, playing a song from the French opera Le Clage de Cornville, specifically the piece Chanson des Mousse, in English, Go Little Cabin Boy, recounting the joy of a life at sea without women. While director William Dixon never indicated that the pair, likely two employees of the Edison Company, at which Dixon also worked, were meant to be homosexuals, the content has caused many individuals to believe otherwise. The most famous of these likely being gay historian and LGBT activist Vito Russo, who, quite famously, renamed the short The Gay Brothers in his 1981 book The Celluloid Closet. Regardless of Dixon's intentions, however, it's interesting to talk about this short, all 17 seconds of it, because it illustrates the fact that queer coding, that being a subtextual portrayal of queerness, neither confirmed nor denied by the canon, has been around since the very beginnings of cinema. Fascinatingly, however, audiences wouldn't have to wait much longer to see some real LGBT plus representation put to screen. Though difficult to tell now due to the inferior nature of the surviving film prints, Cecil B. DeMille's 1922 film Manslaughter was the very first to feature a kiss between two members of the same sex. 
Of course, it's not a particularly flattering example, allegedly taking place during a massive orgy, but it is interesting to note just how far along we were, even a hundred years ago. 1927's Wings, the first film ever to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, only built on this representation, first by showing a same-sex couple during the film's most famous tracking shot, but also by including the first ever gay kiss between two men. It should be noted, however, that not every movie around this time handled the subject of LGBT plus characters as sensitive as Wings. While still representation, many gay characters were portrayed as sissies, their flamboyant and effeminate nature being the whole of their personalities, their purpose in the story usually being nothing but comic relief. Here, Clarence, put that in the trunk. And don't wear it. Selfish. In even worse cases, such as the 1915 film Miss Fatty's Seaside Lovers, there was no LGBT plus representation at all, the bulk of the film's jokes being the sheer fact that a man was dressed up in women's clothing, the beginning of this derogatory school of drag humor that has honestly only recently started to go away. By the time of the 1930s, it seemed like homosexual representation at the very least was here to stay, with movies like 1930's Morocco featuring the female lead kissing another woman, and Al Jolson's Wonder Bar once again having two men share a dance this time with much more obvious implications. May I clock in? Quite certainly. Boys will be boys. But as the Great Depression came on and the amount of ticket buyers began to wane, Hollywood became desperate for an audience. They went purely for shock value, not only increasing the amount of stereotypical sissy representation, but also introducing themes such as prostitution and, for the first time, putting an emphasis on violence and nudity as well. Their efforts might have brought audiences back, but it also resulted in something they couldn't have seen coming. For the first time in cinematic history, there was to be a strict production code. Our American people are a pretty homely and wholesome crowd. Cockeyed philosophies of life Ugly sex situations, cheap jokes, and dirty dialogue are not wanted. Decent people don't like this sort of stuff, and it is our job to see to it that they get none of it. On June 13, 1934, the Motion Picture Production Code, often referred to as the Hayes Code for its association with William H. Hayes, the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America at the time, went into effect. This code proposed in large part to curtail government censorship after the United States Supreme Court ruled motion pictures to no longer be protected under the First Amendment rights in 1915, as well as to appease the Catholic and Protestant groups that had been so outspoken against the content of early cinema, saw the establishment of a strict set of guidelines to which all motion pictures must adhere. And though the code was not all bad, significantly decreasing the number of racist stereotypes such as blackface, for example, its insistence on the elimination of sexual perversion, something that any relationship outside of marriage, especially a homosexual one, was thought to be at the time, meant that suddenly any and all LGBT plus representation was at a standstill. Of course, films continued to be made, and there continued to be LGBT plus characters, but they were no longer so obvious to general audiences. Much like the couple in Dixon Experiment 40 years prior, characters were simply queer-coded, if their queerness was even included at all. Take The Children's Hour, for example, a 1934 American stage play containing a subplot about two teachers having a lesbian affair. When it was adapted to film under the name These Three in 1936, not only was this plotline cut, but the two women were made to be in a love triangle, each dueling for the affections of the same man. When queerness was included, it was simply coded in, and usually took the form of the film's antagonist. You see, Hollywood knew that the public at large, specifically after the institution of the Hayes Code, would never accept an LGBT plus protagonist. But an LGBT plus villain? Well, that was just a clever way to use the audience's inherent dislike of a community as a shorthand for making them hate an antagonist. This is why characters such as Prince John in The Adventures of Robin Hood. <laughs> you hear that, gentlemen? Here's poor Gisborn so in love with Marion, he dares say boo to her. And this saucy fellow gives her better than she said. Joel Cairo in The Maltese Falcon. See, Mr. Speed, I'm trying to recover ornament that, uh, shall we say, has been mislaid. Mm -hmm. And Brandon Shaw and Philip Morgan in Rope, 
This is a museum piece now. We really should preserve it for posterity, except it, it's such good crystal and I'd hate to break up the set. Are all laden with an undercurrent of homosexuality. And although the Hays Code was soon to be gone, this trend was, unfortunately, only just beginning. By the 1950s, the Hays Code was slowly losing its grip on the industry. The 1952 Supreme Court case, Joseph Burston Inc. v. Wilson, resulting in the overturning of the initial 1915 verdict and ruling motion pictures protected under the free speech of the Constitution's First Amendment. And honestly, until the establishment of the current film rating system in 1968 by the Motion Picture Association of America, or MPAA for short, Hollywood was back to being a more or less lawless land. Of course, the work of the Hayes Code could not be undone immediately. Though references to LGBT plus characters were more welcome than before, they were played rather subtly, such as the reference to two male neighbors upstairs, interior decorators or something, in The Seven Year Itch, or the 1961 remake of The Children's Hour, this time being made under the same name as the play, that kept the lesbian romance, yet left this entirely to subtext. This version of The Children's Hour is also notable for another reason, that being the establishment of the rather unfortunate, but now quite famous, bury your gays trope, in which LGBT plus characters are killed off at a disproportionately higher rate than their straight counterparts, the real world reasoning behind it being that they must pay for their alleged sins. Of course, the death of queer characters in cinema goes all the way back to the aforementioned couple in Wings, but throughout the 50s and beyond, these deaths feel much more deliberate, as if they are in direct response to the sexual promiscuity that the Hayes Code had banned, and now, for queer characters to exist, it must be only for them to fall victim to their own deeds. Even if a character isn't seen as a literal victim of their own self-hatred, like Shirley MacLaine's Martha in The Children's Hour, they are often still a victim of the hatred of others. Such is the case with movies like Advise and Consent, where Don Murray's Senator Anderson is blackmailed for a homosexual affair he had during World War II. Even Salmoneo's character Plato in the 1955 film Rebel Without a Cause, despite not being openly queer, is clearly coded as such, and despite his death having little to nothing to do with his sexuality, he is still killed in the movie's clothes, as if the filmmakers knew that the Hollywood system would never allow a queer character to escape their movie unscathed. If this queer-coded character somehow wasn't seen as a victim, they were instead perceived as a victimizer. Characters like Norman Bates in Psycho, Dr. Robert Elliott in Dress to Kill, and Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs all serve as examples in the continuing trend of queer-coded villains, the audience's disgust at their serial killing only amplified by their apparent desire to cross-dress or receive gender reassignment surgery. Though I happen to like a number of these movies based on their own merits, it should be noted that the twisted depiction of LGBT plus people in them was having a potentially harmful effect on the audiences watching them. As noted in my introduction, film is meant to mirror society, but so too does society mirror the films. In the case of Psycho and Dress to Kill specifically, these characters are regarded as mentally ill criminals with multiple personalities, something which certainly didn't help to reduce the negative stigmas society already held against them. Fortunately, LGBT plus theater patrons and allies wouldn't have to wait too much longer for a new leaf to be turned. It would be disingenuous to pretend that there was absolutely no positive LGBT plus representation through all this time. Obviously, pre-code Hollywood was a lot more progressive than we now give them credit for, and underground filmmakers like Andy Warhol and Kenneth Anger, both gay themselves, made a variety of experimental films surrounding the subject. Anger making films as far back as 1947, such as Fireworks, hinting towards the homoerotic nature of the supposed manliness of naval officers with his 1963 film Scorpio Rising doing very much the same thing with the bikers of the era. It was 1964's The Pawn Broker, however, that featured Hollywood's first confirmed homosexual character in film. Another notable film of the time was The Detective, which, despite surrounding the horrific murder of a gay character, actually saw Frank Sinatra's titular detective 
defending his quote-unquote lifestyle to the other cops. Did you ever know Theodore Lightman Jr.? Lightman? Yeah, one of your kind. No, I never knew him. Don't worry, son. No one's gonna hurt you. You're not gonna tell my parents, are you? Did you know him? No! Take it easy. These people are not murderers. After the Stonewall riots, the spark that effectively lit the fire that was the gay rights movement, LGBT plus characters were finally able to come to the forefront. Though these movies still suffered from victimizing their queer characters to a certain extent, they were no longer simply coded as such, they could simply be. 1970's The Boys in the Band, despite dealing with such familiar subjects as self-hatred in the gay community, was different from the others, as it went at these topics from the perspective of the gay characters who made up the entirety of the cast. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, correction, ladies and ladies. And although it was criticized for setting the community back in some regard, depicting these men more as stereotypes than actual characters, the boys in the band still marked the first major American motion picture to revolve around LGBT plus characters. Representation continued to improve throughout the 70s, with such films as A Very Natural Thing, one of the first American films solely about gay relationships, and Cabaret, one of the first to openly depict bisexuality, though this reference is admittedly limited strictly to dialogue. Uh, screw Maximilian! Of course, not every film was so progressive. The 1980s marked the beginnings of the HIV and AIDS crises, and alongside them the rise of the religious right and Republican Party, both of whom went out of their way to ignore the pandemic, if not directly promote homophobia because of it. Films like Cruising and Windows depicted their queer characters in an extremely negative light, their antagonists not simply being queer-coded, but being out as gay, yet being depicted as deranged and dangerous because of it. Other films like Making Love, which depicted a married man coming to terms with his homosexuality, were fairly progressive, but were buried shamefully by studios. Making Love in particular actually causing Fox president at the time, Marvin Davis, to storm out of the theater after saying, and I quote, that they had made a faggot movie. It wasn't until the mid-80s that there started to be movies actually addressing the pandemic and critiquing the government's actions during it. The first of these was Parting Glances, starring Steve Buscemi in his first leading role as Nick, a gay man diagnosed with AIDS. Not fair, you've been in love a bunch. Just once, really. Okay. Now he's gone, right? It's right here. This was soon followed by Longtime Companion, and perhaps most famously, Philadelphia. The latter film being released in 1993, the same year that Bill Clinton instituted the ridiculously harmful Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, which banned any gay, lesbian, or bisexual people serving in the United States Armed Forces from engaging in or even talking about any LGBT plus activities. Though these movies were absolutely steps in the right direction, with Philadelphia being so well received it landed Hanks an Academy Award. They did receive a fair amount of criticism for the continuation of the barrier gay trope, as each of these movies featured characters who died of AIDS, or at the very least, were going to shortly after the film's close. With the dawning of the new millennium, however, things really began to reach their peak. Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain not only provided a very human glimpse into a gay relationship, but was critically and financially well received, almost landing the Oscar for Best Picture at the 78th Academy Awards. Other such well-received films of the era included Monster, which portrayed a very loving lesbian romance between the two protagonists, despite being centered around the life of real-life serial killer Eileen Warnos, and Milk, which followed Sean Penn in the role of Harvey Milk, a real-life gay activist, as well as the first openly gay man to be elected in public office in California. In 2016, Moonlight, a film exploring the difficulty in one man's facing of his sexual identity, at three distinct moments in his life, was released to near-universal acclaim. Its big win at the 89th Academy Awards signaled the beginning of a new era, an indication that perhaps society had reached a turning point, and general audiences were not only ready, but eager to accept LGBT plus stories.
Unfortunately, it seems as if Hollywood might have had different ideas. So where does Disney fit into all of this, you may ask? I did say at the beginning of this video this was going to be about Disney's heterosexual agenda, and I've barely talked about them. Well, that's because I feel like context is of the utmost importance in this situation. To show where we've been with LGBT plus representation, and also where we're going. Much like the art of cinema itself, Disney has had queer-coded characters since almost its very beginning. In 1938, only a year after Disney's release of their very first feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, they released the short film Ferdinand the Bull, concerning a bull who does not conform to the traditional expectations of masculinity, more interested in smelling flowers than engaging in a fight. The Reluctant Dragon from 1941 is similarly queer, featuring an effeminate dragon who encourages the knights to drink tea and dance instead of fight. With the onset of the Hays Code, this queer coding, much like that in live-action films, turned strictly to the villains, however. Notable examples of this include Captain Hook in Peter Pan, a garishly dressed villain who preys on young men, Ursula in The Little Mermaid, herself modeled on famous drag queen Divine, and Governor Ratcliffe in Pocahontas, who, well, see how I do it. As we've entered the modern era, you might suppose Disney's LGBT plus representation might have progressed to match their peers, but in all honesty, it really hasn't. This can be narrowed down to one reason and one reason only. A little thing called the international market. You see, the United States may be getting slightly more progressive in terms of LGBT plus acceptance, but other countries, specifically Russia and China, where same-sex marriage is still criminalized, are not as eager to embrace the change. Take the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast, for example. Aside from being just a soulless cash grab of a movie in general, it also marked the first in a series of movies recently that Disney has sworn would introduce their first openly gay character this being LeFou, Gaston's sidekick. But when actually viewing the movie, this exclusively gay moment, as director Bill Condon put it, is nothing more than a blink and you'll miss it instance of LeFou dancing with another man. It's this film that really began the accusations of queer baiting by Disney, in which creators hint at, but refuse to actually depict same-sex romance or LGBT plus representation. And honestly, I'm inclined to agree with that belief. Despite the film's half-assed attempts to pander to LGBT plus audiences, it was still banned from being shown in Kuwait and Malaysia, and though Russia did not censor the film outright, they did increase the age rating to an adults-only rating of 16 plus, citing the film's alleged perverted sexual relations as gay propaganda against minors, despite the fact that there's essentially no gay content in the first place. It's this instance that I believe caused Disney to rethink their strategy. Because despite claims by their creators that such films as Thor Ragnarok and Solo A Star Wars Story were going to introduce bisexuality and pansexuality to their respective cinematic universes, the movies themselves were entirely silent on the subject. It wouldn't be until 2019's Avengers Endgame, the 22nd film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that they would feature their first confirmed LGBT plus character. Even then, however, this character, played by co-director Joe Russo, was in a brief 30-second scene where he simply talks about going on a date with another man. The sentiment behind it is nice, but why throw this scene in instead of one showing an actual LGBT plus relationship? Hell, Valkyrie, the character they previously confirmed to be bisexual but literally haven't done anything to indicate that yet, is even in this movie. They could have given her a scene. No, instead Disney wanted to play it safe. Not only to not offend anyone, but in the act of directly trying to appease those armchair critics who ridiculously claim that LGBT plus representation is being shoved down their throats, even though it appears in only about 2% of films being made today. In short, that scene in Avengers Endgame is the way it is because Disney wants to keep your money. They created a moment blatant enough to satisfy people blindly calling for LGBT plus representation without actually caring what it consists of, and vague enough so that it could be dubbed over to appear heteronormative to appeal to international audiences. Disney's approach on the Star Wars and Pixar ends has been, perhaps unsurprisingly, quite similar. After fan speculation for the duration of the Star Wars sequel trilogy that the characters of Poe and Finn might be gay, 
So much so that Oscar Isaac, who plays Poe, said he was in support of the idea. There could have been a very interesting forward thinking, like, or not even forward thinking, just like current thinking <laughs> love story there. You know, it's something that hadn't quite been explored yet, particularly the dynamic between these two men in war that could have fallen in love with each other. But the, the, the Disney overlords were not ready to do that. Disney went out of their way in the trilogy's final film, The Rise of Skywalker, to not only not pair up the characters, but instead give each of them a female love interest with whom they shared absolutely no chemistry. But it's all good because I guess we know they're not gay now. Admittedly, I don't find the case of the Poe Finn romance, or lack thereof, to be as harmful as many of the other fans, as I don't think the filmmakers ever genuinely intended to pair them up, but honestly, it wouldn't have hurt to. What I do find to be harmful, however, was Disney's apparent olive branch to the LGBT plus community, where instead of having two of our leads share a same-sex kiss, they instead had two random background characters share one, their kiss being relegated to a single shot that could easily be edited out of international releases. Pixar's Onward did feature Disney's first openly gay character in animated form, a police officer voiced by real-life lesbian Lena Waithe, but her sexuality was, once again, a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment. A single line about her girlfriend's kid. It's not easy being a new parent. My girlfriend's daughter got me pulling my hair out, okay? Oh, uh, yeah. Of course, Disney is not the only studio guilty of queer-baiting its audience. Notable examples include Paramount, who before the release of Star Trek Beyond swore their iteration of Sulu was gay before cutting out a kiss with his partner. What once was 20th Century Fox, who cut the only three minutes of explicitly gay material from the Chinese release of Bohemian Rhapsody, and Warner Brothers with the Fantastic Beasts franchise. Although honestly, the less said about J.K. Rowling and her problematic views, the better. Outside of major studio releases, however, LGBT plus representation has improved drastically. Tangerine, released in 2015, offered a painfully realistic glimpse into the life of a transgender sex worker. 2017's Call Me By Your Name gave us an emotionally resonant depiction of a gay man's first romance. And films such as Boy Erased and The Miseducation of Cameron Post, both released in 2018, have provided a heartbreaking look into the lives of the queer people that have been forced into highly unethical forms of conversion therapy. Even Disney, outside of their blockbuster releases, has shown to be more than willing to embrace LGBT plus representation, with main characters in Disney Channel and Disney Plus shows, Andy Mack in High School Musical, The Musical, The Series, Jesus, that's a mouthful to say, both being openly gay. In 2020, they even released the short film Out, featuring a gay protagonist's journey to come out to his parents, albeit directly to Disney Plus. With all this in mind, Disney, and Hollywood in general, clearly has the potential to expand into wider representation, but they clearly just don't care to. And until Disney stops pandering to their audience, terrified of taking any actual risks that could lose them money, I'm not sure they ever will. This is why I have such a hard time believing Kevin Feige when he talks about incorporating more members of the LGBT plus community into future Marvel projects. Because even if there is a gay kiss in Eternals, one that was apparently so emotional that the whole cast cried on set, I kind of doubt their stories are anything but good PR. The kiss will probably be a fleeting moment, either a close-up in a cutaway or in the distance of a wider shot, intentionally hidden so that audiences who do not approve can miss it, but they're just enough so that Disney can pat themselves on the back for technically including representation. Despite my cynicism, I do hope Eternals will surprise me. I'd love to look back on this video years from now in disbelief at how wrong I was, because we need representation, all of us. As much as I love films that focus on the strife of queer people, something that is unfortunately quite integral to many of our lives, I would also love more movies akin to Booksmart or Supernova, movies where the main characters are queer but it is not what the movie is about. Their romance is treated as a fact, almost blandly, in the same way that it would be with a heterosexual couple. And I think, in all honesty, that's really what the end goal of representation should be. I look forward to the day where a blockbuster movie with LGBT plus representation can come and go with little fanfare. A day on which interviews do not need to be published and articles do not demand to be written. A day when we are all simply treated as equals. 
not simply for the purposes of propaganda, but because we are all humans with equally valid feelings, and whose stories all demand to be told. As always, I would like to thank you guys so much for watching. This was a huge undertaking, but I'm honestly really happy with how this turned out. I know I've said it before, but I really am going to try and make these videos a more regular thing, so please do like and subscribe if you haven't already. I've started a podcast since I last uploaded, Directed By, where my friend Austin and I make our way through director's filmographies one by one. We're currently discussing Zack Snyder, and I'd urge you to check out those episodes if that sounds like something you're interested in. Don't worry, it's a lot of us shitting on Zack Snyder, we don't really love what he's about, but, but they're fun, but they're fun episodes. I also have an Instagram account I've recently started uploading my photography to, as I'm trying to get more serious about that, uh, as well as a Letterboxd account, on which I very regularly review movies, so if you for some reason value what my opinion is on something, want to hear more about me talking about movies, I write on there a lot. Um, I would love for you to check any and all of those out, and let me know what you think. Links to the podcast, my Instagram, the Letterboxd, they're all below in the description. But I think right now that is it for me. I hope I gave you something to think about. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you next time.